Hey, this is Dr. Ben White's host of the Rational Wellness Podcast. I talk to the leading health and nutrition experts and researchers in the field to bring you the latest in cutting edge health information. Subscribe to the Rational Wellness Podcast for weekly updates. And to learn more, check out my website, drwhites.com. Thanks for joining me, and let's jump into the podcast. Welcome, everybody. We're going to get started. I'd like to introduce uh, Steve Schneider. Steve, why don't you come on up and <laughs> tell us about uh, Integrative Therapeutics, which uh, we appreciate as one of our sponsors for this evening. Um, no bright lights, though. So. Um, hi, I'm Steve. Some of you, most of you know who I am. Um, is that working? Um, yeah, hold it close to your mouth. Like that? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, normally we have samples and literature stuff, but because it's the new year and we're rebranding, we don't have any of that stuff now. But I'm going to mention a couple products, and if, you, if you're interested in any of them, we can connect and I can get you full-size trials of them. Um, for autoimmune, we had three kind of ones in mind to talk about. One of them was, one of them was our glutathione cell defense. Um, uh, silver, Quicksilver has done a really good job of convincing everybody that you have to have liposomal glutathione to increase glutathione levels. That's not true. We happen to have one that has been shown to increase glutathione levels in a dose-dependent manner. It's a higher potency, less expensive per milligram, and less expensive per day than the Quicksilver one. Um, it's in capsule form. It's a great product. Uh, the other one I wanted to mention, and if you've been here before, we mentioned it for every topic because it's good for everything, is the Curalee, which is our new high bioavailable curcumin. Um, if you're familiar with our Theracurmin, it's about five times more bioavailable than Theracurmin. So. Some of the guys that helped create their acumen spun off on their own. They created this new product. They came to us and said, hey, we think this is better. We'd like you to market it for us. And we looked at it and went, oh, God, it's better. So now we have both. We're not discontinuing their acumen, but the Cure Leave is the real deal. Uh, new delivery technology, not a whole lot more expensive. Um, and then the other one that we want to talk about real quick is vitamin D. It's not anything sexy, but we have some really, really tasty chocolate chewable vitamin D <laughs> tablets that everybody who uses them loves them. So all of those are something that I'm happy to let you try and uh, just find me later and we can talk about that. Uh, by the way, if you happen to be watching or viewing this uh, on Apple or YouTube, uh, these these offers are for practitioners only. <laughs> Good point. Um, yeah. Heather Sunshine from Cyrex. Integrative Therapeutics. Please come yeah. up and tell us about um, Cyrex Labs, our other sponsor for this evening. And thank you for that. Hello, everyone. My name is Heather Sunshine. I think most of you guys probably know me in the past as Heather No. So I recently got married and you know why I didn't hide my last name, right? <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> I am the territory manager at Cyrix Laboratories. We are a specialty lab. We focus on environmentally induced autoimmunity. We understand the environment plays a huge role, such as the foods that we eat and chemicals that we're exposed to the pathogens. So those are in our environmental trigger panels. And then we also have um, barrier panels, since we understand that um, that's the gateway to autoimmunity, neural autoimmunity. So we have intestinal permeability screen, our um, blood brain barrier, and irritable bowel SIBO. And this is um, serum kit, okay? And it is the, done by Eliza Methology. And but what sets us apart from all the other last or four pillars of excellence, um, we have antigen purification system because Dr. Wichitani understands that the test is only as good as the purity of the antigen. We also optimize antigen concentration. We understand that each food um, has different amount of proteins, so we validate each and every single one. We get a reference rate specific to that food. And then we also do a side-by-side -side testing. And then we also have our flow cytometry test which is our lymphocyte map test, which is a laser, uh, advanced laser technology, providing you with B cells, T cells, natural killer cells, TH1, TH2, CD4, CD8, just to list a few. 
uh, providing you ratios, counts, and percentages. So I'm looking at your new system right now. So I have a lot of materials at my booth. Please come by and grab those. And if you don't want the hard copy, I can send you a PDF as well. Thank you so much. Thank you, Heather. And our speaker for this evening, the esteemed Dr. Risto Mashani, the father of functional immunology, and he's going to be speaking about early detection and prevention of autoimmune diseases. Dr. Mashani has a PhD in microbiology. Uh, he's a very prolific researcher. He's published hundreds of scientific papers. Um, I'm a member of Research um, Gate. I don't know if you're on there, but constantly another paper by Dr. Bastani. He's just unbelievable. Um, and he's also published two books. He's the CEO and technical director for you know, Sciences Lab, and he's the chief science officer for Cyrex Labs, and he's developed all of their tests. He's also a professor in the Department of Preventative Medicine at Loma Linda University. Uh, he was awarded the Linus Pauling Award, and he was also um, uh, awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award by Jeffrey Bland's Personalized Lifestyle Medicine Institute. Thank you, Dr. Weissstein. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Ben. And I'm extremely happy. I'm here. Bro. I'm extremely happy to be here in person. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> Finally. And uh, all of us wish you uh, <laughs> optimal health. <laughs> thank you. Okay. So. As you know, I get about 30 different journals every month. Immunology-related and medicine-related journal. And in past two, three years, I read more and more articles about predictive immunology. Predictive immunology. And that's what all of you are doing. Um, so, Tonight, specifically, I'm going to talk about mainly predictive autoimmunity, which is major part of predictive immunology. So I decided to start with this slide. Just look at the title. You know what is ANA, anti-nuclear antibody? All of you know what it is? Anti-nuclear antibody is the best test for screening for autoimmunity. Majority of them. If ANA is positive, probability of the next five to 10 years, the person will develop some kind of autoimmune disease is very, very high. So up to like five years, 10 years ago, they were looking at anti-nuclear antibody, and in healthy population, so-called, found between three to five percent had anti-nuclear antibodies. And because they didn't have any symptoms of autoimmune disease, they, you know, they, they just disregard that, that anti-nuclear antibodies. So Dr. Miller, Frederick Miller, uh, who I think retired about a year ago, before that published this fantastic article in archives of uh, arthritis and rheumatology, where he looked at occurrence of anti-nuclear antibodies between 1990 to 2000-something, 10, 12, like in 15 years. And he found that, this is, the, you see the increase. So in 1970, let's say it was only 8% uh, Sharp increase in the positivity among U.S. population. So the question I'm asking, what do you think the reason is? This is indication of the rise of autoimmunities. Please, 
exposure to a toxic environment. Thank you yeah. so much. I'm glad you did not mention that improvement in testing. <laughs> okay, that's what rheumatologists are saying. But believe me, I work in clinical lab for past 40 years, 50 years. The same methodology we used to use 40 years ago. We are using the same method. Nothing has changed. So don't try to sell me that. So thank you so much. Okay, now that's one issue. Um, the second issue is this. Our genome is different from each other. Our fingerprint is different from each other. Our immune print is different from each other. So the question I'm asking, three different individuals, if you look up there, with three different immune prints, let's, let's take like 10 different individuals. Six of them will be in the middle, only six of them. They are, they enjoy from balanced immune system. We, they are in the right sweet spot. Three of them will have hyperactivation of the immune system. One of them, hypoactivation of the immune system. Autoimmunity, immune deficiency. So why is it that when we get sick, when I got sick from COVID and went to see the Sina, they put me right away on dexamethasone without looking whether I was falling in the middle, in the right, or to the left. I was lucky that I was among this group. I had hyperactivation of the immune system and the cytokine storm and all of that, so this medication helped me. But think about that individual. What dexamethasone will do to that person? Probably will kill that person. So we cannot, so the, the, the we cannot take everybody and say, okay, one medication for all. That's why the beauty of um, personalized medicine. And also, uh, in scientific journals, we read a lot about personalized treatment. So I just, uh, the, the other thing is, the third thing I would like to say, when we do measurements, the three groups, there is a pattern. So, if you look at total immunoglobulin in the middle, that's, that's the best level of total IgG. It starts from 700 all the way to 1500, but to me, that's the best, around 1000. This individual is having 1812. It's very high, so hyperactivation of the immune system. Ask yourself, and then that individual, low total IgG. And then if you look at secretory IgA, there is a pattern, also is low. Uh, then TNF alpha is low. Th that, that is humoral immunity, the soluble factors in the blood. You look at the cell-mediated immunity, lymphocytes are low, B cells are low, CD4, CD8 is, ratio is low. Here is high, that one is in the middle. So therefore there is a pattern, correlates with each other. And the main reason is that a person having low total IgG, who is making the IgG? The B cell. So don't be surprised why we have no B-cells in the same individual. So the same thing. So therefore, there is a pattern uh, in the immune system, and that's what really, you know, that's why we measure so many tests simultaneously in order to detect, to increase uh, 
and the detection probability of detection of immune disorders by testing more components of innate adaptive immunity, humoral cell mediated immunity, and mucosal immunity. So yesterday I gave a lecture uh, through Rupa. And the lecture was about systems immunology. What I was talking about right now is all about systems immunology. And system immunology is really, you have to look at immune system as a whole, holistic. You cannot look at IgG only without looking at B cells, which is producing it, right? So just look at it, this title of this article from August 2023. Making human immune system more interpretable through systems immunology. And then predictable human immunology holds implications for better diagnostic and curative precision in patients with infections and immune associated diseases, that's almost everything. So now to, let's talk about autoimmunity. We do not go to bed, wake up in the morning with autoimmune disease. It takes many years to develop an autoimmune disease. So the green is the ideal place to be. But there are three different stages of autoimmunity. Stage one, which is silent autoimmunity, you do testing like ANA, chromatoid factor, immune complexes, um, actin antibody, mitochondrial antibodies, and then you see some elevation. But the patient doesn't have any symptoms. So that's one. Stage two is antibodies are elevated with some symptoms and loss of functionality. So, and then of course stage three is elevated antibodies, significant symptoms uh, and signs of lab and other tests are abnormal and lots of loss of function. And so the art of immunology, the art of medicine is to detect at least at the stage one. So by finding the triggers, as you said before, try to remove the triggers and prevent progression from stage one to stage two and stage three. I think this is the central message. Okay. Now let me share with you also very important information. Again, the reference is right there, published in Journal of Autoimmune Disease uh, or Autoimmunity, where Dr. Ma or Professor Ma looked at predictive antibodies for different autoimmune diseases. And again, uh, you know, uh, in the interest of time, I you know I choose only one slide from very important article. Uh, so first of all, we know that genes plus environmental factors play a role in autoimmunity. Gene is one third, environment is the other two third. Okay, so that's given. So. They found that antibodies appeared in the blood in three years up to 19 years for some disorders. Look at anti-mitochondrial antibody. So the antibody we produce against our own mitochondria and then for almost 19 years we don't lose uh, we do not develop, for example, uh, liver autoimmunity. 
but in other cases, maybe three years, anti-myelin basic protein antibodies uh, are detected three years before development of multiple sclerosis. So therefore, these antibodies, even three years, can help us to stop, at least, progression of autoimmune diseases. That's why it's important to do testing. Another slide which I like, that, <laughs> that the antibody is the driver, but he's a crazy driver. He's driving 250 miles per hour with Toyota. Okay. Now, if T helper 1 and T helper 17 become also crazy together, that car will have an accident, and that accident is going to be an autoimmune disease. So there is collaboration between antibodies and cell-mediated immunity as well, that we should not forget that. We call Th1 and Th17 auto-reactive lymphocytes. They are important for our functionality, but these are the ones that cross the blood-brain barriers and attack the neurons. Or they release, for example, IL-17, which is a cytokine, and that cytokine can activate microglia and other cells to attack the neurons. So this is the, the panel that we do at the Immunosciences Lab. It's not very expensive. Are these T-cell mediated um, factors also triggered by the same types of triggers for antibodies? Yes, yes, yes. thank you for asking. Example, very well established that T helper 17 become activated with too much salt. Very well proven. And infections, toxic chemicals can activate T helper 17. Yeah. T alter one as well. So then G plus environmental factors. Food, infections, toxic chemicals, and their effect on our gut microbiome. When I published this was about five years ago, or no, two, three years ago. But in Last two, three years, I became a little bit wiser because I read more articles about microbiome. And our microbiome is equally important as our microbiome. Yeast in our food, molds and mycotoxins in food are really major sources of activation of T helper 17 and down regulation of uh, TH1 or overactivation of TH1, uh, down regulation of, excuse me, T rex cell, responsible for induction of autoimmunity. So that's why highly recommend also for patients with autoimmunity, not only you are fixing the gut microbiome, you have to try to fix also the microbiome. We used to talk about Candida albicans, you know, uh, many, many years ago. I published an article in 1988 that Candida albicans cross-reacted with human tissue, including thyroid. And our friend, mutual friend, with Dr. Kast and uh, Dr. Rosenbaum, Michael Rosenbaum, we mentioned his name tonight. So he was, you know, at that time, treating patient with autoimmunity for Candida albicans, Tropicalis, and there are many other uh, molds involved. So in my opinion, when they test for urine mycotoxins, those urine mycotoxins are coming from molds and mycotoxins from food. 
and they are not coming from exposure in the building. At least 80% of them, that's what you think. But, but you're suggesting that the mycotoxins in the food are equally problematic as the mycotoxins more. more? Way more. Based on what I'm reading now, way, way, you know, I published at least 20 different articles about molds and mycotoxins uh, in different journals it started 25 years ago. But now, today, I'm standing here saying that molds and, uh, I'm sorry, yeast and molds in the food are significant, are very significant in induction of autoimmunities, particularly um, autoimmunity in the gut, including Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. Yeah. So, an article, yes, environmental factors contribute to change our microbiome and mycobiome. I didn't put the other slide. So you agree with that? Okay, so now we know the environmental factors are changing. And these are some of them. It's a beautiful slide, it's in my book, that uh, stress could do that. Abnormal gut microbiome, uh, uh, gut microbiota composition, this is about leaky gut now. We take it one step further. Uh, medication. Uh, when we make lots of inflammatory cytokines, uh, undigested food, especially lectins and agglutinins, food colorings, and gums. And later on, you'll see the plastic. Plastic, I, I, I have a slide for it, that is changing the gut microbiome. You'll, you'll see this slide later. So, when we have disturbed gut microbiome and microbiome, this is what is going to happen to our tight junctions. Release of lipopolysaccharides, cytolethal distending toxins, and some enzymes such as enolase which is involved in many autoimmune diseases released by, uh, for example, candida, all can break down the tight junctions, ocrelin, zonulin, and so forth. The consequence of that is entry of unwanted large molecules to the submucosa and in circulation immune reaction against that, now we have five different type of antibodies against food, against tight junctions, against lipopolysaccharide, against cytolethal disturbing toxin, and other antigens. So this is the mechanism as a consequence of uh, environmental factors effect and our gut microbiome and microbiome resulting in some of these auto-antibody production. So in 2000, actually 1998, I was working on a test, test development. That's one of my specialties, my fun. And I developed this test called intestinal barrier function. In 2000, year 2000, I got a patent for it. And it was about measuring antibodies against five most common food. Egg, soy, corn, wheat, and milk. Gram-negative bacteria and gram-positive bacteria, aerobic, anaerobic bacteria, and yeast. If the antibodies were elevated simultaneously against all of these. We said the patient is having then, again, I'm talking about 1998, leaky gut syndrome. Yeah. And, and as you know, then was just the beginning. Nobody was aware of leaky gut and gut microbiome and all of that. 
And, and so this is a new version of the test, which was patented in 2015. So what we do, we measure antibodies against acting components that you saw in the slide that the toxins break down the high junctions and also destroy the epithelial cells. So actomycin or actin, we make antibody against them. High junctions are bacteria zonulin. You make antibody against those, right? And then lipopolysaccharides produced by E. coli, Salmonella, Shigella, and Klebsiella, name it. So this is one of the best tests that uh, I recommend to order when, for the first time, the patient walking in your office and you don't know where, where to start. Not to spend too much money, just this will be the test. And you see, for example, this individual is having antibodies, acrylic zonulin, and significant level of IgA antibody, which is much more important, because it's, it is, its origin is from the gut, and against lipo, lipo polysaccharide. So this individual suffering from gut dysbiosis and leaky gut. Now, Lots of you know Dr. Karazian, okay, right? And I had the pleasure of working with him for many, many years. In fact, he did his PhD thesis in my laboratory. So they looked at couple hundred blood samples sent by different doctors to Cyrex laboratories for this test. Right, for this test. And then they found some of them, like half of them, for simplicity, I'm saying that half of them were positive for the gun, the other half completely negative. So it's positive, right? Then the doctors also ordered. Array 5, which is multiple autoimmune reactivity against 24 different tissue antigens. When they did, and this was, the tests were done a year, two, five years later. They went and took the data and analyzed the data. And the findings were unbelievable that for, uh, if the individual had leaky gut, the probability having autoantibody against it, their own tissue was between 5 to 30%, 34, from 5 to 34 more. So I think in uh, one of the magazines they wrote this article based on you know, the, that publication that if you have leaky gut, probability of developing autoimmune disease is 34. So here, when they were negative for leaky gut, the blue, very low level of antibodies against fibrillin, which is involved in rheumatoid arthritis. The same thing are treating peptide. And the red shows the level of antibodies in individual with leaky gut. And there are seven, eight different slides that just shows one. And the same thing, parietal cell antibodies. ASCA and ANCA. What is ASCA? Antisaccharomyces cerevisiae IgA antibodies. That's, that's the yeast in the food that we should remove it from our diet, whether it's in beer or in bread. And ANCA is anti-neutrophil cytoplasmic IgA antibody. So ASCA is in Crohn's, ASCA antibodies, ANCA antibodies in ulcerative colitis. When the neutrophils become activated due to some environmental factors, they release these antigens and we make ANCA antibody. So that was fascinating. So. Uh, here in the article, they say uh, when they did logistic regression analysis, there was a 3 to 30 fold increase 
So that's maybe I, you know, I said five to thirty, but they say three to thirty-fold increase probability of developing autoimmune disease if you have leaky gut. And in, in another study that uh, um, I did not put the slide in here, but if you do leaky brain, meaning blood brain barrier, seventy percent correlation between. That's my publication with Dr. Carasia in 2020. If a person is making antibodies against components of gut barriers, it's going to make also 70% probability of making, or in 70%, making antibodies against blood, <coughs> brain barrier protein system. And so this test, Heather was talking about during the introduction. I call this, or we call this, the <laughs> essential barrier panel. I'm not sure if uh, still this is available, Heather. The combination of all three, I highly recommend it to be done at the same time. So it is leaky gut, Leak, uh, leaky brain. This is for uh, irritable bowel and SIBO, but we are testing antibodies against bacterial toxins. It's, it's just more than just irritable bowel syndrome and SIBO. LPS is different antigen, and bacterial cytolytic of this thing toxin is different antigen produced by different bacteria. So I highly recommend this test. Yeah, I think most people are not aware that SIBO is actually an autoimmune disease. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Chronic SIBO. So, so these are the major, major panels offered by Cyrex. So I'm not going through this, but it is all about um, environmental factors and their role in the induction of inflammation autoimmunity, and neurodegenerative disorders. Okay. So I started with this, saying that the immune system, you see, is, is uh, in people is as diverse as height, beauty, intelligence, and other features. And you know, you remember that why three different people getting the same medication? And, and that is because there are so many cells in the blood. And by the way, there are receptors on those cells. It's called CD, cluster differentiation. Today, we, uh, I believe that we have about 350 different cluster differentiation and different type of lymphocytes. But today, clinically, these are the most important ones. So in addition, looking at antibodies for autoimmunities, you have to assess the cell-mediated immunity. And this is the most comprehensive way. You look at T cell, the B cell, the ratio CD4, CD8, or helper cytotoxic, their ratio, T helper one, T helper two, their ratio, regulatory T cell, which regulate the immune system. T helper 17 protect us against pathogens, but also causing autoimmunity. If Overactivated. That's why we, we look at the ratio of Treg and Tr17. Natural killer cells. Just an article published two days ago in journal called Microorganisms. You can go online and download it if you write Bojdani article in Microorganisms about natural killer cells, and you'll get that. So we used to look only at the first two, CD56, CD16. 
NK T cell. It's not natural killer cell. It's T cell with receptor for natural killer cell on its surface. But these are the new, the new development. CD57, wrongly, they used to use that for diagnosis of Lyme disease. But how can a, a, a natural killer cell could be used for diagnosis of specific infectious disease? So it turned out they were wrong. But this cell, CD57, is a major cell fighting viral infected cells and tumor cells. And also it's doing immune regulation, regulating the immune system because they produce cytokines. Now, when you combine CD57 with CD16, they become super killers. And guess what? When we get older and older, we get more of the CD57. Because when we develop autoimmune, we have become more prone to autoimmunity. It seems that, you know, uh, the body makes more of these cells in order to prevent autoimmune disease and cancer as well. So these are cells fighting against cancer and autoimmunity. So that's why we should have more of them. And then finally, CD57 joint forces with cytotoxic T cell, CD8 cell. Also, they become super killer. So all of these are uh, being reviewed in that journal article called you know, Natural Killer Cell uh, Journal of Microorganisms. So, <coughs> the complete picture of the immune system, uh, only could be discovered if we looked at humoral immunity, antibodies, and cell-mediated immunity. So the antibodies, you see the ELISA plate, we take drop of blood, dilute it a certain amount, and then we add it in duplicates to the plate coated with an antigen. Let's say lipopolysaccharide. After addition of several reagents, finally color develops. The color, strength of the color, is proportion to the amount of antibody in the blood of the patient. And so a Lysa reader is going to read that. And we get the information, how much antibody the person is making. So simultaneously, we take another tube of blood. This time is lavender tongue. We take drop of blood. In that drop of blood, there are lots of cells, T cells, B cells, Th1, Th2, and so forth. There are monoclonal antibodies against those 350 cluster differentiations available. We add them to that drop of blood, and the cells become red, green, blue, in different colors. The flow cytometer is going to separate them based on their colors. The computer is going to count them. And then now we get also assessment about cell-mediated immunity. So we take the integrated data between humoral and cell-mediated immunity, and with that, hopefully, you are going to translate that in your practice to take care of your patient. This is the best way to look at the immune system. Now, environmental factors can affect both humoral and cell-mediated immunity. In fact, cell-mediated immunity are more even sensitive to environmental factors because Again, antibodies are produced by the cells, after all, right? So any miscommunication between different cells of the immune system results in abnormal production of antibodies. Less antibodies or more antibodies. So foods are one of those. Undigested food, and that's the book that uh, I wrote a few years ago. 
But still that book is added up itself by 20 years. I don't want to be selfish. <laughs> so many years ago, I asked this question. When it came to, for example, gluten, if wheat has so many proteins, like hundreds, why do we measure antibodies against one only, which is alpha gliding 33 amino acids? So, so that became evolution of a way three. And, and today we are measuring antibodies against 12 different proteins, three different transglutaminases, and one which is called microbial transglutaminase or meat glue, which is everywhere in the restaurant and everywhere in some uh, different foods that we purchase. So then, around 2008, I asked this question. And I, I'm going to ask uh, Ben, do you eat raw potato? Uh, no. Do you eat raw beans? No. no. Thank you. So why laboratories were doing testing for food sensitivity, which all copied many years ago, I did on the food IgG testing in 1986. So, so why they measure antibodies against potato, raw, raw potato? Do you get the same information if you cook the potato and measure antibodies? Completely different. Beans special, right? If you cook them, if you don't cook them, we the nutritionist in here. What will happen to us if we consume raw beans? So the fact that we cook them and we can uh, eat them without any problem, meaning that there is change in antigenic structure after cooking. So that also is going to affect the testing. So they, those labs, either giving you false positive or false negative results. So when I developed Array 10 for Cyrex, we came with testing. If we eat food in a raw form, we measure antibody against raw form of that food. If we eat it in a cooked form, we measure antibodies in a cooked form. And if we eat it bone, raw and cooked, then we measure antibody against poison. And so that's how you get the most reliable test results by testing array 3, 4, 10, and so on. Okay, so that's major environmental factor is food that we discuss. And you see in here that different groups, especially uh, even guns, guns, they're everywhere. But do you know what is molecular size of a gun? The lipopolysaccharide, for example, is an antigen produced by E. coli salmonella. What is the size? 65,000. Like albumin. Albumin in our blood is about 60,000. Grounds are 5 million. Okay. So uh, they thought they are going to be in and out. That's why they added to everything. But in reality, we are going to digest them to smaller molecules, like uh, the, the 5 million becomes. Uh, eight or ten times, fifty thousand, or not, a hundred times of uh, that, and then we react against them and we make antibodies. Oleocytes are proteins found in the oils. Nobody's testing against them. We test. And of course, lectins and the proteins uh, contribute so much to autoimmune disease. For example, in one of our publications, we found that we German glutamine cross react with thyroid peroxidase. So definitely patients with thyroid autoimmunity, we have to remove lectins and the glutamine 
from their diet. So that was about food. Now, toxic chemicals. Just look at this uh, slide. Definitely, toxic chemicals, when they get into digestive tract, can change the integrity of the gut, can ch change our microbiome, can change our microbiome, and, and therefore uh, cause permeability problems. And chemicals by themselves do not challenge the immune system directly. But when they bind to human tissue, for example, if we take some heavy metals, by chance they get into our blood, those heavy metals may bind to hemoglobin or albumin. And now our immune system is going to attack a combination of heavy metals with hemoglobin or albumin. And now we, it's kind of autoimmunity against our own proteins. So that's what the, the mechanism. We call the, we, the terminology for that is neo antigen formation or new antigen formation, but chemicals bind to human tissue proteins. Now, I would like to back to this issue. It was in the news, look up there, okay? Hundred times more tiny pieces of plastic that was previously estimated. This was in the news almost ten days ago. Yeah. Right? And then I think it was seven o'clock news or nine o'clock. Uh, and then at the end, the guy added something, said, but we don't know really what is the clinical effect of these particles. So he completely destroyed the news. Because, you know, it is against the industry. They had to say something about it. Now, I was lucky enough, the next day, I read this article in Journal of Molecular Sciences. How this tyrant microplastic exacerbate candida albicans infection ability, infection ability, in vitro and in vivo. So here the best evidence that toxic chemicals, this is toxic chemical, endocrine disruptor competing with our hormones can change our gut microbiome. So these are some of the antibodies that at Cyrus we are measuring against these chemicals who form new antigen with human tissue. And you see bisphenol A, bisphenol binding protein, tetrabromobisphenol A, tetrachloroethylene, and then cosmetics, parabens, and heavy metals. So this is about contribution of uh, toxic chemicals to autoimmunity. Pathogens. These are the three amigos, right? And so, SARS-CoV-2, I published by now 10 different articles about contribution of SARS-CoV-2 to autoimmunity with international groups, including Professor Schoenfeld, who organizes the International Congress of Autoimmunity, which this May is going to be in Slovenia. But we knew already about Epstein-Barr virus and HHV6 for more than 30 years. These viruses are responsible for development of many autoimmune diseases. And example, Epstein-Barr virus and thyroid autoimmunity, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, the same thing uh, for HHV6 
And now we know the SARS-CoV-2 is doing the same. So in the case of long COVID, it is not just SARS-CoV-2. SARS-CoV-2 infection causing reactivation of latent viruses, EBV and HSV6, and therefore viral persistence resulting in inflammation and autoimmune. What are we doing with time? So that's why we test against 29 different pathogens, part of the RE12, which share homology with human tissue. Every single item that you see in here, including oral pathogens, which are the first two, or Yersinia intercolitica, they have special group of amino acids, peptides, which share homology with human tissue and antibody against them may contribute to autoimmune diseases. So here's some example of uh, looking at FCMR virus, cytomegalovirus, herpes 1 and 2, and herpes type 6. This, uh, this patient is having reactivation of FCMR. Why? Because early antigen is positive. And the normal condition that is absolutely negative. Made IgM antibody against cytomegalovirus. So there is ongoing infection with cytomegalovirus. And look at herpes type 6, the highest level. So one patient, three different viruses, and this patient will if uh, most probably was in the process of developing autoimmune disease if was not going to be treated for these three viruses. This is one of the articles that, the first actually article I published in 2021, January 2020, where we took monoclonal antibodies made against SARS-CoV-2 spike protein, 100% pure, and added that to about 70 or 80 different tissue antigens that I have in my lab, and found that about 25 of them became highly positive. That was the best proof that SARS-CoV-2 directly contributes to autoimmunity. That article by now was viewed by more than 200,000 scientists. Most of my articles got to 10,000, 20,000, but this one, 200,000 only. So that is contribution of SARS CoV 2 to autoimmunity. So, I already gave you some introduction about contribution of SARS-CoV-2, EBV, HSV-6, uh, that together contributing to inflammation and autoimmunity. This article, you can download it from a journal called Viruses. And in relation to long COVID, yes, the viral persistence, reactivation of EBV, HSV-6, release of super antigens, change of gut microbiota and change or effect on the immune system altogether may result in multi-tissue autoimmunity. And that's why this is one of the tests I developed for immune sciences lab for lung COVID, which is a blood test. We measure antibodies against SARS-CoV-2, EBV, and HSV6, and another version of that also, we measure also autoimmune panel as well. But combination with other tests like leaky gut and 
El Mal by Cyrex is going to make the picture more tough. And, and here you see the example of an article that autoimmunity is the hallmark of post COVID. Many patients with uh, long COVID, they develop autoimmunity. And you see the percentage of it. In fact, they call that poly autoimmunity. Not only one autoimmunity, different autoimmunity. So, testing for long COVID, and it's overlap with M, myalgic encephalomyelitis, and chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, I summarize it in right here that uh, SARS CoV 2 antibodies, we do an immunosciences lab, EBV, HHV6, immunosciences lab, lymphocyte immunophenotyping, Cyrex. Antigenic intestinal permeability array two, Cyrex, and then biomarkers of autoimmunity, that, that autoimmune panel, which is right here, all together. Um, we do an immunosciences lab, and here, example of a patient positive for SARS CoV 2, positive for HHV6, positive for EBV, BCA, and early antigen. So this, this, you know, this patient should be treated for EBV and HHV6 in order uh, to prevent autoimmune disease in this individual with long COVID. And indeed, when we did the autoimmune panel, please know, ANA was negative, but ENA was, you know, although it's not very high, but that is the beginning of autoimmunity. The same thing, rheumatoid factor, the same thing, C1Q, and the same thing for uh, anti-actin antibody. So this individual was in the process of developing autoimmunity due to EBV, CMV, and HHV6. And just to take something home, um, different treatments based on different articles that I read in scientific journals, including uh, right here, zinc, lotus, hydroxychloroquine, and azithromycin. And then some even give NAD plus, this publication. Uh, the, all of this, anyway, please, if you want to take a picture, take this home with me. So that's the message, and finally, a uh, couple slides that tie everything together. How a healthy lifestyle can lead, unhealthy lifestyle, can lead to inflammation in the brain. So, fire in the gut. Break down into gut barriers and the ninjas breaking the blood brain barriers. And now, inflammation is in the brain, resulting in multiple autoimmunity, including autoimmunity in the brain. So, with that, I would like to read something for you and then present only three, two or three slides from this article. So my friend, Dr. White, says that those who think they have no time for healthy eating will sooner or later have to find time for illness. So please pay attention to the title of this article. Healthy diet and lifestyle improve the gut microbiota and help combat fungal infection, which is also part of the, the gut microbiota. And beautiful pictures right here, okay? Uh, unhealthy diet pattern contributing to inflammatory pathogenesis and gut dysbiosis. So look at all of this. Alcohol, unhealthy lifestyle, antibiotics, 
chronic stress all together affects the gut barriers, the blood brain barriers, the immune system, humoral immunity, cell mediated immunity. That's one. The second, look please at these options with official effect of a high diet high in vegetables, fiber, vitamins, micronutrients, omega-3, fatty acids, probiotics, prebiotics on the gut microbiota. I think the picture is beautiful. And finally, the last slide. Okay. So again, these are all antifungal, so the, the emphasis now is not just on microbiome and microbiome, and these are some which are good for uh, preventing the growth of the microbiome. I'm not going to read all of that, just look at the picture and please take some of these pictures with you and share with your patients and you can download this article in the same journal, Microorganisms, that I published my article two days ago about natural cures. Thank you so much and I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Would you give us an example of a patient who, say, has test positive for leaky gut and test positive, say, for infections or toxins, how the lymphocyte map test helps us to manage that patient? Thank you. Okay. In early 90s, I was dealing with many, many patients who had history of exposure to different toxic chemicals. Uh, example, people who were working for Lockheed and Boeing, by thousands became sick because at the end of the day, they were washing <coughs> their hands and their body with solvents to get rid of grease and all kind of things that they used to work with. And they develop immune disorder. And when we tested their blood, we found that about 30% of them, you remember the three babies that I showed, three individuals? 30% were on this side, hyperactivation of the immune system, 10% hyperactivation, and then in the middle, of course, were some, they were okay because we have different immune print. How did we do that? We found then, based on looking at CD4, CD8 ratio, T cell, T cell, CD4, CD8. Elevation in CD4, CD8 is indication of inflammation and autoimmunity. And reduction in CD4, CD8 ratio below 1.5, especially 1.0 is indication of immune deficiency. Just with that knowledge, CD4, CD8, and then we used to call that chemical induced AIDS. Because everybody was thinking about AIDS, virus, virus, but here chemicals can do the same thing. So the infocyte map then was very helpful to us. But today, because we are looking at TH1, TH2, for example, yesterday I presented a case about um, For a second, uh, mast cell activation syndrome. Okay. How can we detect that? By looking at TH2. The patient had very high TH2 and low T rect. And also looking at TH1, TH2, and T rect, TH17, low T rect, high TH17, high TH1. That's the, the fingerprint of autoimmunity as well. And then natural killer cells, possibly, you know, when the, so the body is calling more soldiers to fight 
find that the patient is having viral infection, bacterial infection, parasitic infection, or cancer. I'm talking about, let's say, NK cells are 15%. Now you find in one of them, 50%, 40% of the cells became natural killer cells. When 40, 50% become natural killer cells, the number of T cells become much lower. The number of B cells become lower. And so complete immune dysregulation. We have absolute fingerprint. We call it immune print based on LMAP. And so therefore, for a patient walking for the first time in your office, if you want to spend the buck the way, you know, uh, the most efficient way of spending the money is to order a Ray 2 and Elma. And if you want help with interpretation of results, either you call Dr. Sunshine, <laughs> which is why he's here, or you call me. And I'll be very happy to help you in interpretation of the test results. I'm just joking because Cyrex has three or four different clinical consultants, but some of you like to call me and I appreciate it. And, and there are natural strategies, supplements, etc., that can yes. modulate findings you. on the lymphocyte map to... Yes, 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 yes. Maybe from now, put me to speak about nutritional immunology for next year. Okay. okay. There is a chapter Again, in the field of immunology, it's called what is uh, immunometabolism, very sophisticated, but the one I like the most is nutritional immunology. So based on hundreds of articles that are collected, for example, for regulatory t cell, we made these flowers with the petals. For example, for T-Rex cell which is regulation of the immune system. Uh, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin C. Why there are receptors and t cell membrane for those. Then cruciferous vegetables. Sulforaphane. Cabbage, broccoli, all, all of them. That's fine. Right. Also have receptor at their surface. So it is a finally acetate, butyrate, and propionate. And I think well amino acid which is in Turkey. Uh, oh, tryptophan. Tryptophan. Yeah, tryptophan metabola, metab meta yeah, metabolism also by to certain receptor and T-Rex. So here, example, of uh, flowers with petals for uh, T-Rex cell, we have the same thing for TH1, TH2, TH17, and so forth. That if, you know, I think you have a copy of it, right? Yeah, I think from uh, last year or the year before, right? Yeah. Yes, but you know, uh, if I will have more time, I have to improve that based on more articles that I read, like last week, another article came out that if you do prepare juice from red cabbage and you give it to your patients with crumbs, they improve significantly. Mm -hmm. What do you think? How, how does it work? It's going to act, you know, to regulate the T-Rex cells. Mm -hmm. That's the mechanism. Okay. Yes, please. I honestly don't know because there is no solid research about ozone. I know there is more studies, for example, about IV vitamin C or oral vitamin C. I published four different articles 15 years ago, 20 years ago. I was working with you know, one study of metagenics, and we gave 500 milligrams to 5,000 milligrams of oral vitamin C, 
uh, for a group of athletes, and we collected blood and urine. We tested the natural killer cytotoxic activity. 24 hours later, in the majority of them, NK cytotoxic activity went up from three to 10 folds. And after 48 hours, went back to normal, meaning you have to take it every day in order to maintain um, healthy natural human cells. But for ozones, unfortunately, we don't have similar research projects or articles available. Okay. So, you have to leave, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it is. It is closing, and we have time for a few more questions. So, if anybody has questions. this line, I understand that dose matters, but these ingredients, coconut oil, cinnamon, and love acid, they're enough to kill the mitotoxins at a level. At a level, will it more normalize the microbiome? Because you're seeing mycotoxin farming that poured up. We haven't learned about him. I think he's in the mold. So, according to this slide, these ingredients can help treat the stable. Did I understand that correctly? Yes. So, well, the, the, I, think, I think all these products is affecting the immune function in the gut and improved immune function in the gut is going to fight the microbiome and the microbiome. Are you familiar with at what dose? Like, for example, how much coconut oil you would need in order to make a difference on the yeast in the microbiome? No, I don't know the exact amount. Yeah. Good question. Maybe you should, you should read the article. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's impressive. It's very I should read the article. All the way through it. <laughs> there, there are nutritional products on the market that have like extracts from coconut oil that are known to have anti fungal properties. So I heard Titi's Crossing say you're not supposed to take coconut oil because it will kill healthy bacteria in the gut. Because it's you're saying, saying that? Titi's Crossing in one of his autoimmune. So you know, that's that's a kind of an ongoing debate. Well, exactly, uh, exactly. I think, you know, was it based on the, an article he presented? Because it was based on it might, might have not been him. Um, I do remember him saying you shouldn't take it. You should take an MCT unless you're in keto. I might be getting my sources confused. That I do remember that he said, but um, the coconut oil thing is depending on who you ask. They're going to say something different. So that's why I was wondering um, if there was a dose that you were familiar with for garlic or for lemongrass craving. Do I think that dose makes a difference? Please. I noticed you have um, tests for lectins, gluten, but are you testing oxalic acid? Is that anything that's come on your radar? No. No. Okay. I know. One of the laboratories was talking about that salt cancer. Because they yeah. create that needle-like effect that seems to be affecting joints. And there's been a fair amount of weird, like, uh, small group interest in that. But I'm beginning to see some uh, some promise in finding out more about it. I don't know how we can measure that because it's not okay. easy. Yeah, yes, shows also. Okay, so that would also show yeah, here. Yeah, but where are they coming from? Uh, Plants. Okay. Everything. Okay. So because recently I read this article about the organic acids, and the organic acids in the, in the urine, uh, all the claims that the laboratories are making, none of them are saying. That's great. Sorry. <laughs> Were there, but I'm interested. I want to hear about that next year. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, everybody. See you next time.
Thank you for making it all the way through this episode of the Rational Wellness Podcast. For those of you who enjoy listening to the Rational Wellness Podcast, I would certainly appreciate it if you could go to Apple Podcasts or Spotify and give us a five-star ratings and review. That way, more people will discover the Rational Wellness Podcast. And I wanted to let everybody know that I do have some openings for new patients so I can see you for a functional medicine consultation for specific health issues like gut problems, autoimmune diseases, cardiometabolic conditions, or for an executive health screen or, and to help you promote longevity and take a deeper dive into some of those factors that can lead to chronic diseases along the way. Um, and that usually means we're going to do um, some more detailed lab work, stool testing, sometimes urine testing. Um, and we're going to look at uh, a lot more details to get a, a better picture of your overall health from a preventative functional medicine perspective. So if you're interested, please call my Santa Monica White Sports Chiropractic and Nutrition Office at 310-395-3111 and we can set you up for a new consultation for functional medicine. I'll talk to everybody next week.